I'm Rafian Stotts, Bellator champion, and tune into the Don't Tap podcast because I'm about to beat the shit Google at this kid, bro. What we've got here is failure to communicate. Hey, I'm UFC President Dana White, and you're in the ring with Callum McGregor. To me, the Lions are the number one rankings out there. Those guys are the ones who really do their homework, you know what I mean? But this fight, I'm telling you, it's a flip of a coin. I we did not tap. Um, Let's go! So, Let's go! UFC 284, UFC Australia, man. Uh, finally went back down under a place I never thought they may ever go again. Um, during the pandemic, uh, Dana White and the actual country itself on um, polar opposites ideas and uh, the way things should run. So I never just thought that we would actually get here again, but we are back in Australia. Mahachev against Volkanovski. I'm pretty excited for the main event, man. And the line, I think, is a little ridiculous. I don't know how you feel on this one. Um, I think we'll just jump right into the main event. Um, Mahachev, 23-1-0. Volkanovski, 25-1-0. Um, really, when it comes down to it, man, it's it, they say it's, it's right now GOAT versus GOAT. It's champ versus champ. Um, I think Volkanovski with a little bit more, obviously, five-round experience and championship pedigree. I don't think he should be a dog like this. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I have to agree on this one. Um, I think minus 365, minus 400. I think it's kind of disrespectful at this point. It's kind of one of these fights, like, whenever we saw with, like, Izzy and Jan Blahovic, where I don't necessarily – think that a lot of people can come in here and say they have a hot take on it, right? Like, a lot of yeah. people are going to, if Liz Lamb wins, everybody's gonna be like, oh, I told you he's going to win, and Volkanovski wins, they're like, well, you know, strength of schedule, and blah, blah, blah. Like, it's one of these fights you can't really break down. They fight in two completely yeah, so different... So, Makhachev right now, if we're looking at before we get into breakdowns here, um, Makhachev right now can be had at minus 350 at bet 365. Um, and you have Volkanovski on the either end at plus 330 at uh, cool bet. So Volkanovski, a you know, potential two-time champ, like he's going to be two-division champion if he wins this. And the guy who we, we thought would potentially hold two belts, the guy who we, we see as the GOAT, the guy who's come back from adversity in the Ortega fight, who's just proven everything. The former rugby player, the, the heavyweight, the guy who... I don't know, man. It's just a very interesting take that a lot of people have. I'll hear your take first, and I'm going to jump in with how I think the fight will break down. But uh, I, I definitely am going to lean the dog, Volkanovski, in this one. Plus 330, I mean, I can't not jump on that one. Yeah, like, I'm going to lean Islam. I do think Islam wins this fight. But I once again, as I was saying, like, it's not a fight that I can come in here and say I have any sort of confidence in. It's two completely different weight classes. I think Volkanovski's fought the much higher level of competition to get to where he's at. And also think that he's um, <clears throat> he's in a little bit of a tougher division as of late. Where mm -hmm. with Islam, like he beat Charles Oliveira and I'll give him that. But like other than that, like beating Bobby Green or beating Dan Hooker, especially at the stage of Dan Hooker's career, like it doesn't really say much about where he's at. So um, I think there's just more of a show me spot. And I, I think, honestly, it's dog or pass 100%, as you said. Like, as much as I pick Islam, I'm going to have to sprinkle on Volkanovski just because I said I think he is the better fighter. I just Yeah, because let's let's walk this through. I mean, so we have Islam that comes in, does decent on the feet, takes down Volkanovski, pretty much owns him on the ground, submits him or owns him for five rounds. That's one play. Another play is the total flip end of the spectrum, the shorter, stockier, um, Volkanovski stops a couple takedowns. Maybe even scrambles on a couple. And all of a sudden, it's left out on the feet. And now if it's on the feet, if you actually look at it, Hachev actually is pretty solid on the feet. But if you look at the two, two of them, there's going to be Volkanovski, who now is carrying 10 more pounds, is going to be as fast and be able to rely on his footwork. That's potential. Um, also, the idea of punching down and punching up. You have an advantage punching up versus as long as it's obviously not too high in differential. But when you're throwing strikes, if you're throwing strikes up versus strikes down, you have a, a lot more of an advantage. And a guy like Volkanovski can exploit something like that. Um, so it's definitely interesting. And the only reason why I position this, you have even avenues where you're going back and forth even a little bit. And obviously, with, with when you have two guys of this pedigree, you can't have a line this wide. The line's just too wide. Like you're saying, dog or pass, this is going to be a play. Um, um, we'll make it very clear 
that you know Mahashev is likely the, the the pick here, but the reality of the fact is Volkanovski at that money, it's just dumb not to take the number. It's it's a bad play not to take the number or to not take the number. So yeah, and um, I said Volkanov- like. We haven't seen Islam's cardio really tested or anything like that either, right? Like most of the guys that he's faced, you know, you're Justin or uh, you're um, Charles Oliveira and stuff like that. Like, you know, they're guys that are known for having durability issues and kind of like a one or two rounder bust types of guys. Where Volkanovski goes five rounds in most of his fights. So I think as this fight extends, I also think it's a good live bet too, man. Like if you think about it, like if yeah. you watch the first round or two. Play. There's a couple of them on this card, a couple of good yeah. live bet opportunities. Like if Islam gets him down on the first, but you see him kind of huffing and puffing and, you know, feels like he worked a little bit hard to get to where he's at, you're still going to get a really good number live on Volkanovski. So to me, it's just a guess that show me spot and, you know, you may be able to find hey. an angle to jump in on. And like even like with the Volkanovski gaining weight, so he could gain weight be a little bit slower, but maybe he's not at all. And then also maybe his his power transitions a little. He, he actually gets a little bit more power in his punches, um, and lands bigger shots. And maybe he he's able to actually even run the the, the wrestling and and really work that extra strength with or that extra with that extra size and whatever else. So, um, just with so many variables plus three thirty sounds good to me. I think that will call out the value play of the week. Next fight on the card, we have Yair Rodriguez, 14-3-0, coming up against Josh Emmett, 18-2-0. Right now, Rodriguez can be had minus 160 at Sports Interaction, and Emmett can be had at plus 142 at Coolback. This one, interesting matchup. I mean, really, if you look at Emmett's last fight, he didn't land everything that he landed, but like everything that he was throwing, sorry, and he was still scoring. Like he scores with the judges. He has big shots. Um, judges like damage or even perception of damage. Um, he looks good in the judges' scorecards that way. Strong wrestling. And if he does touch you, you're going to sleep. So definitely an interesting problem for your yeah, your Rodriguez. Um, yeah, it was Kelvin Cater that he had fought. And Cater... Vicious with the elbows, vicious with the striking, but not as dynamic as Rodriguez. Rodriguez is definitely going to be posing a threat. But, man, that guy doesn't really play up to his potential. Would you agree with that? For sure. It's a, it's a little bit of an issue. Like, the guy, so talented. It's, like, possibly one of the, the most vicious knockouts I've ever seen in my life. He bends over at the hip and throws an elbow backwards, catches a Korean zombie. Possibly one of the worst knockouts I've ever seen. Has the, all the talent in the world, but just doesn't quite live up to it, and looks like he's getting beaten fights all at the time. So interesting. I would like to hear your take on this one. We have Yair, Yair Rodriguez against Josh Emmett. What you take? Yeah, I man, I'm all in on Josh Emmett on this one. Um, I think with Yair Rodriguez, a lot of people <clears throat> are kind of thinking they're just going to come in here and style on him based on the Max Holloway fight. But like whenever you watch the Max Holloway fight. He did work to Emmett, or he sorry, he did work to uh, Max's foot in the beginning, and I feel like that heavily changed the course of this fight. Um, with Emma coming to Team Alpha Male, man, this guy's been a money machine for me. He's a guy that I've bet every single time blindly, and not saying I'm betting him blindly in this spot, but I just think that Yari is a uh, Yari is the type of fighter that tends to give up in fights, and he's the type of fighter that doesn't like to get hit. So he only has a one inch reach advantage. Emma's can be able to beat in his face, and you know, you look at guys like Max and Calvin Cater, they're guys that are very durable and able to take a punch. I don't think Gary is going to want to take those punches. So, and he doesn't come in with the most explosive power. Like, yeah, you have the kill over the Korean zombie, but like, it's, you know, they're very like circumstantial knockouts. Like he's not coming in here and just one punching people. With yeah, like he's got to set guys up, right? He's got to be more technical with his strikes, even though it's yeah. a little flashy, but he's got to set it up, but. Um, with Emmett, he does have possess that power, and, and the wrestling and as well is going to play a role too. I think he'll be able to have enough fight IQ to mix it up, and I think Alpha Male will come with enough of a game plan um, to make this dicey enough that if it goes to the scorecards, you can see it either way, depending on the volume. And if I even, even looking at it like that, I'll take the plus money on the dog. But I actually do think Emmett uh, wins this fight. Yair Rodriguez would have to come in and super version of himself, and, and I just can't bank on something like that. So that's not happening. You know, I mean, he could come with a crazy ass knockout, right? And we could be like, oh, wow, the difference in the two fighters. But it's like he catches you with this crazy ass knockout. It's like he catches you with it. He sets it up, sure. But Emmett's the try tested and true. I think uh, can't argue with that. And I think I've I sort of faded him in the past to my own uh, demise. 
So and another I thing will... on Yaria, man, is like, you know, we look at these guys, like whenever he's fighting Max and he's fighting Calvin, like there is no fear of a takedown at all. Where we even saw with TJ Dillashaw, right? Like whenever he fought Corey Sanhagen, TJ Dillashaw isn't a guy that comes out and wrestles at all. He's, you know, one of these wrestlers that fell in love with the striking, but he possesses that wrestling ability. So whenever Corey starts throwing spinning stuff, it's a real easy for him to grab a hold of you, get the cage control. And Emmett can utilize the exact same game plan. So, okay, next fight on the card, we have Randy Rude Boy Brown, 16 4 0 against Jack Della Maddalena, 13 2 0. Jack, the favorite right now, minus 286 at Cool Bet. And we have Randy Brown coming in as the dog at plus 265 at North Star. Another line I think that is a little bit too wide. As much as I'm a, a big Jack backer, um, I'm, I'm not going to find myself on the other side of this, but um, I'm also a big Randy Ruboy Brown fan. Um, I, you know, I'll just jump in with this one. I just think that with, when these two line up, um, Randy Brown's striking is like pretty stellar. His boxing is, is pretty on point. Is it going to be enough to really evade the damage that comes from Madalena? I don't know. Madalena is willing to take one or two to get in there. And, and then once he lands, he, he works that body really well. Um, he just everything is placed with damage and intent and it's scary and I can't bet against it um, I'll find a way to bet for it because I think although I'm a big Randy Brown backer and if we're looking at these two when they clash I just see Brown getting caught at some point in the fight and, and you know it may not be as early as, as Jack's used to getting some guys out of there because I think this is obviously the step up competition that we've been waiting for him, but um, we'll definitely go with Jack Della Madeline on this one and I even heard recently that uh, Randy Brown has had a little bit of an issue with getting acclimated um, to Australia as well, too. So I don't know if that'll play a role as well, but you know, if that's a negative, it's a negative and it's already, you know, I'm already obviously looking at Jack. So lines too wide. I hope it gets closer and tighter. I don't think it's going to though. So I'll likely look at Jack for a prop and we'll call it a day on this one. Yeah, like I like Jack by K on the spot. It's minus 110, you know, because I don't like any of the overs or unders just because, like, I agree with you. I think the line's wide. I think at some point in time, Jack's going to find a chin, whether it's with a body shot that kind of drops him and leads to the finish or if he's just able to catch him clean. The thing with Randy Brown is that he leaves himself open way too much. And he said he carries it like uh, Nate Diaz, like – um Bobby Green style where he'll like hit you a couple times and like smile at you and he wants to taunt you. And like, I, I just think it's a bad game against a guy that's got such good boxing. You know, he's just going to leave opportunities open. And the first round I've said since this fight got announced will probably be closer than people think it will be. But as the fight progresses, he's going to get clipped with something. So I like Jack. I just, I, I think this fight gets a little bit more extended than his last couple. Comparing to uh, Randy Brown to Bobby Green is a good example, actually, because he can slip out of the way of two punches, but but the guy like Jack, he'll follow, right? He's going to keep going and he's going to chase you down. So he'll throw that third punch or that, you know, that kick on the end of a combination. Um, and then he's going to catch a guy like that, right? So it's able to, you're able to look good in, in someone that wants to box with you that's going to throw a one, two, maybe a three punch combination and you're going to be able to slip and evade it. But when you have a guy who's just coming forward with just violence, it, it's hard to evade that kind of thing. I think we're on the same side of this. You know, I I do think the line is a little bit too wide. The over would maybe be interesting, but then Jack could catch him early. Um, I think just by KO is probably the play. I think you're right on that one. Keep it nice and simple. Call it a day. Next fight on the card, we have Justin Taffa, 5-3-0, coming in against Parker Porter, 13-7-0. Um, let me just get uh, this... On DraftKings right now, minus 125, you can have Justin Taffa, um, and plus 120 at Cool Bet. Park Porter can be had as the dog. Um, I got a couple takes on this one. I think this, this one could be, potentially even be a live betting situation. Um, maybe gets, you know, just to throw it out here quick, you know, maybe Porter get, whether well, there's a storm in the first round, and uh, you get a little more value out of him as it goes into the second and third, and he either squeaks two rounds late in the fight and or finishes uh, Tafa late. Potential, to, to, you know, an angle. Not necessarily the way I'm looking at it exactly, but, you know, there's a couple avenues here. So what, what, how do you look at this one? Justin Tafa, 5-3-0, Parker Porter, 13-7. Um, I like um, – sorry, I like Parker Porter in this ball, man. I don't rate Justin Tafa that high. 
I think he's honestly on this card just because of the Australia uh, connection and stuff like that. And I just like, man, like, like he's not good. Like he comes in here, relies too much heavily on his power. He's got no grappling whatsoever. And he doesn't throw a crazy amount of output. Um, he was robbed in the Carlos Felipe fight, but other than that, man, like it's, I think Parker Porter is going to be able to come out here. I think if he wants to get him to the ground, he'd be able to. And the striking, I even think that he's got advantage in, other than the power, but Parker Porter is not the type of guy to come out here and just get clean clogged. So I like uh, yeah. Parker, sorry, I like Parker in the spot, man. And there's a lot of dogs on these cards where I think that it's really only um because of the hometown advantage, the lines are the way they are. Yeah, I think uh, Parker Porter has enough, um, you know, his, his striking is decent enough to be able to uh, evade the big strike from Tafa. But the one thing with Tafa that we showed, his power does carry late, but he does have cardio issues. So he does gas and, and you know, he's not really thinking there in the fight late, um, but his power still is there. But at the same time, it's just, he's got to place that power. And I think Porter's going to be at least enough of a step up in competition that on the feet, it's not going to look, you know, too nice. That being said, if you look at a, a line that's quite interesting is uh, I like the under two and a half. Because I think that if Tafa falls off a cliff a little bit with the, the cardio, and then at the same time, the, the, the level of competition sort of exposes itself and Par- Parker gets him out a little bit later, um, that's a potential there. If not, Tafa, if he does land big, he does land that big bomb, you're covered as well too. Um, I don't know if that'll be a play, but it's something I'm at least looking at and toying with. But I like Parker Porter third round decision as uh you know maybe a play to match up with that under two and a half you cover both angles with it but uh anyways we just have to remember that justin taffa lost a decision to jared vendera yeah that was a brutal watch <laughs> so before you go betting justin taffa you couldn't finish a guy that gets finished in pretty much all of his fights so i don't know yeah his win condition is just like a hail mary kato a rock on the string <laughs> Next fight of the card, we have Jimmy Crew 12-3-0, Alonzo Menefield 13-3-0. And what are the lines currently sitting at right now? Uh, right now, Jimmy Crew is a minus 180 favorite with the return of Alonzo Menefield being a plus 155. I know how much you love Alonzo Menefield. Um, to give you a little bit of an idea, I'm sort of leaning on the crew side of things. I think with his pressure, it's going to be an issue for Menefield. Showed issues uh, being off his back foot. Uh, a little bit of a cardio issue. You can get lost in the fight at times, although he possesses the power. Um, but I will pass it off to you. What, what do you think on this one? Jimmy Crute, Alonzo Manifield. Yeah, man, this is another one where I'm going to side with the dog on this. I don't – the thing with Jimmy Crute is, man, it's like it's one of these guys that's just failed to show good fight IQ over and over again. With a guy that does tend to lean on his grappling, he goes in there against Jamal Hill and doesn't lean on his grappling at all. And honestly, it tries to engage in a firefight with a guy and gives him his own his only win condition. Alonzo Manifield's a big dude. He's been showing crazy amount of fight IQ in his last couple ones. He's, you know, he's exploring the wrestling a little bit more. He has been able to do damage on the ground. And his boxing has even looked a little bit more clean and more technical with a lot less wild hooks. So I think Alonzo Manifield finds Jimmy Crute's chin at some point in time. Yeah, I don't know, man. I think that uh, Crute's pressure, if he mixes in a little bit of the grappling off the cage, he can make it a little bit dicey for, for Menafield, who's shown a little bit of issue with the cardio and the gas tank. Uh, that being said, you know, of course, in you mentioning some of the things that you mentioned, I know we we have backed Menafield in the past and following the William Knight fiasco and, and some of these scenarios, we, well, at least I have started to fade the man. Uh, he does work well behind the jab and he does have strong wrestling, but at the same time, Maybe I'll just stay off this one because I find myself maybe I'm just fading him to fade him. I do have a play on the next one, though, so we will jump into it. We have Tyson Pedro coming in at 9-3-0 and against Modestus Bukakis, uh, 13-5-0. And, and right now, um, Pedro can be had for minus 250 at Patano, and Bukakis can be had for plus 200 at Patano. Um, obviously, you know, Modestus goes on a two-fight uh, win streak after losing his leg to Khalil Roundtree um, in, you know, what was possibly one of the worst leg breaks I've ever seen in the cage. And so, yeah, he goes back on the regional scene, two-fight win streak, comes back in against a Tyson Pedro who's just running through people, destroying people's souls. Um, it is scary to watch. 
So I just think that this is just a bad play for him. I mean, in the UFC, Bukakis has been knocked out. I think he went to a split decision, I think it was. And then he gets his leg broken. Not really a good play. Um, the guy is a solid striker, but I just think that he's not going to be able to handle the power and the pressure and the steamrolling, um, you know, nature of Pedro. So the play I actually like on this, instead of just picking a side, I actually like the under one and a half right now. And if you correct me if I'm wrong, if you can check the line on this, but I believe it's plus 115. Let's take a look. Um, the under one and a half is, yeah, plus 116. Yeah, so plus 115, plus 116, yeah. So I, I just think that is a play. I, I don't know if you agree with me on this one, but, you know, we can take Pedro straight up at minus 250 and then also go the under. Um, I think it's a good same-game parlay for uh, DraftKings. Um, what's your take on this one? Yeah, I agree, man. Like, uh, Medeskis Bukaukas, like, you know, he got cut from the UFC. He went into Cage Warriors. He won two fights over there. <laughs> but once again, like, not – didn't look the greatest. Like, he kind of – he carries the same flaws, like the type of guy that just keeps his hands down. And like against a guy like Pedro, um, Pedro's been leaning on striking a lot more, but has a lot of submissions on his record just the same. So I think it's Pedro and by however he wants to do it. And I have to agree with you. I think he probably gets him out of there in the first round. If Medeskis even threatens with the striking, I think he'll probably shoot. So that being said, the time to fade Pedro is going to come soon if he wins this fight. Because I don't rate this guy very high either, but... They're really giving him a hometown rub on this one. Yeah, he's definitely – he's a force. He pressures forward. He's got that power. But, I mean, something like that will get exposed by somebody who has the power and the technique as well too because um, someone's going to circle off and catch him with a hook or something quite dirty like that. But um, Okay, next fight of the card we have Joshua Kulabau, 10-1-1 against Melsic Bagdasarian, 7-1-0. Uh, Kulabau can be had right now at Pinnacle for minus 108. We got to pick him here right now, and uh, Melsic at even. So, um, we have Melsic Bagdazarian coming in, strong kickboxer, clean, pretty precise with the striking. Um, he'll slowly pick you apart and work those leg kicks. He's scary to see. Obviously, he hasn't fought in quite some time now. Um, and on the flip side of things, we have Kulabau who actually sort of came in and surprised us in the last fight against, um, who was the, yeah, he fought uh, Sung Woo Choi. And we didn't see it coming, man. I didn't see him actually being able to do what he did in the stand-up battle in that fight. He was able to actually press forward, uh, implement his will when he needed to. Um, when he was getting chased, he was able to counter well, um, just sort of impose his will. That wasn't split decision, but it was just, it just came out of nowhere. I think a lot of people were on the Sung Woo Choi uh, side of things. I think maybe we were just maybe fading the pool a little bit too much. I think he was more inactivity at the time that was maybe leaning us away from him, but he does possess, possess the power in his punches. But I just think that Magnus Iron is going to be able to land cleaner. It's like you were saying before, who was it you were mentioning before about just landing cleaner strikes to set up those knockouts. I, I think this is what's going to happen in this scenario. Cool about that needs to rely on some of his pressure in order to actually, you know, win. That's how he plays his game in the stand-up. I just think he's going to get caught. He's going to get countered on the way in by Bagdazarian. Um, the guy's just, you know, he's he's been out for a little while. I think he's going to probably make a statement in this one, to be honest. I always do my tape study and then I look at lines. And after I looked at this card, I was like, man, I'm sitting at like 70% dogs right now. So maybe I'll have to find some props I like. But um, <clears throat> as for this fight, man, I have to agree. So if you look at, how do you say his name? Josh what? Kutalaba? Kulabau. I don't know why I keep saying Kutalaba. It's not Ian Kutalaba. Kulabau. So with Kulabau, you know, he's got 0 for 11 takedowns in the UFC. Like, I, you rewatch the Jordan fight. He shoots for about seven takedowns. Can't land any of them. Jordan's the type of guy that, you know, that's his how he loses because he's got dog shit takedown defense. And as for his striking, he throws real winging wild shots. Or with Melsic being such a good kickboxer, I think this is Melsic all day. I think that he's just going to be able to dance around him, land the bigger shots. And I feel like a lot of people are off of Melsic because of his last fight. But his last fight against Bruno Souza, the guy fights like Leota Machida does. Ironically, I think he trains with Leota Machida. But, like, he's a real hard guy to fight. Like, so it's kind of hard to give him bad rap over that fight because, you know, Souza didn't want to engage in that fight at all. So, you know, how do you fight somebody who doesn't really want to fight you? In this fight, um, Kulabau is going to come right at him. 
And I think that his striking is just going to be so much better on the Bagdasarian side. That, as you said, I think the counters are just going to be there all day. He's a much better kicker. And it's a bigger cage, man. So I feel like he'll be able to dance around and just do work. Yeah, I just see a, like a I, – I can see Bagdasarian like a angle change, hook, something. There's something coming, man. It's uh, one way, one way traffic, I think. So we'll go to the next fight on the card. Fleetson Rodriguez, 7 2 and 0 against Shannon Ross, 13 6 and 0. Uh, Rodriguez can be had right now at minus 270 at Cool Bet, and Shannon Ross can be had for plus 270 at DraftKings. Um, you know, obviously, Cleason Rodriguez, sharp striker, dangerous forward pressure, but able to actually also step back, counter when he needs to. He was really clean on the feet, man. Um, the one thing he showed a weakness on was he can't really run on his back foot for too long. His last fight, he showed a little bit of gas, um, really had some major issues. Um, so I, I don't know, like there was a little bit of a clink in the armor. I, I would imagine someone at that level, he's young, talented. Um, I would imagine he's going to come back stronger, come back with a better game plan in this one. Shannon Ross, um, you know, solid stand-up, scrappy, durable guy. Um, really, he's going to have to protect his chin on his way in. You know, he leaves his head pretty up there. Um, Rodriguez will explo- exploit that and expose that in, in the fight. Um, but right now with the line so wide, this isn't really a dog or pass. This is not even, I'm not touching it. I'm on, uh, I'm on the Rodriguez side. I think Rodriguez is the pick. But right now, I mean, Ross's key to victory is going to be able to actually, he's going to have that weather their storm at points and then just pressure and pressure and, and, and see what he can do to Rodriguez late, if not uh, edge a decision this one. But that's Ross's path to victory, but Rodriguez is the side. The line's too wide at this point. Yeah, I kind of agree, man. Like, I think the line's wide. I think Shannon Ross, um, he was a huge favorite going into his fight on the Contender Series and got absolutely blasted in that fight. I, I remember there was a story that went around that he had appendicitis or something like that, something that kept him from being able to grapple and put himself in, like, set positions. But, um, yeah, man, my take on this fight is the fact that it's going to go the distance. Right now, sitting at plus 100, I think it's a good play. I think with Rodriguez... You know, he's going to have that threat of the takedowns coming his way and the pressure from Ross because he kind of fights like a little Frank Yeager. And um, I think that it will probably slow down this fight a fair bit. And I think regardless who wins it, it's going to be close. The line's wide. And I think Fico in the decision or even the over 1.5 that sits around minus 220 is a good probably piece because I said I think this fight gets extended quite a bit. I do lead Rodriguez, but, you know, he had that loss to C.J. Vergara, and C.J. Vergara has a relatively similar style to Shannon Ross, and that's what kind of worries me. I don't know if that was just a spot where, you know, first UFC fight, and he really was, you know, the he really needed that t- to kind of like break through the bright lights, or is Shannon Ross going to be able to come here and show the fact that, you know, he is as good as we thought he was, and the line of the Contender Series was just a screw up. So we'll have to see. Yeah, it's a good show me spot. I think we'll just sit back and watch this one. Next fight in the card, another potential show me spot. We have Jamie Malarkey coming in at 15 5 0 against Francisco Prado, 11 0 0. And I think he's everybody's dog, or at least I hear some rumblings of people's dog uh, pick this week coming in on short notice. Um, so, really, what's the line currently sitting at right now, man? Uh, right now, the line's sitting at minus. Minus 255 for Jamie Malarkey with the return on Francesco Pardo being plus 215. Yeah, I mean, Malarkey's won three of his last fights, uh, five fights. He's beaten Michael Johnson, Devontae Smith, uh, Kama Worthy. Um, and, what I mean, one of his losses is to Jalen Turner. You can't really fault him in that. Um, he's pace, pressure. He breaks guys. He is hittable, though. That is the one issue that I would say. Um, but he just pushes pace. He gets a little bit sloppier as he moves on, but he's just got will and he'll just press you and pressure you and press you and pressure you until you break. Um, so really, I mean, with Prado, you could see a lot of people are really on his side. He's got the power. Uh, he does really bring sort of chaos and what I could see in some of the tape that, that he brings a lot of early finishes. Um, so I think the one way you can maybe look at this, and I don't know if you would agree with me on this. I don't know if I'm giving Prado too much credit, but if he does end up coming in and, and you know, beating up Malarkey a little bit in the first round, go Malarkey live back. Um, Because Malarkey, if it does play out like that, right? So if Butter does come in and, and bring this chaos and make Malarkey look like, you know, uh, he's maybe not supposed to be in there in the first round, 
Malarkey will then re regroup and likely potentially take over. Um, so interesting take on it, but uh, I don't know. Obviously, Malarkey's decided, in my opinion, uh, this is a step up in competition. But uh, what's your take on this one? Yeah, I'm going to lean Prado, but it's with no real confidence. I like, um, <laughs> I definitely like violence in the spot, man, because you're getting a good line on it. It's only a minus 165. I thought it would get more steam than it was. Prado's finished every single one of his fights, and he generally doesn't get out of the second round. Um, the type of dude that blocks punches with his face, he gets clipped in most of his fights that he's in, and he's going to engage in a firefight. He's taking this fight on short notice, so I feel like cardio can be an issue. And Jimmy Malarkey finishes most of his fights as well. So, What we've got here is failure to communicate. Hey, I'm UFC President Dana White, and you're in the ring with Callum McGregor. To me, the Lions are the number one rankings out there. Those guys are the ones who really do their homework, you know what I mean? But this fight, I'm telling you, it's a flip of a coin. I... He did not tap. Let's um, go! So... Let's go!